we didn't talk about who we're going to talk about, but. And I don't have any of the other. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the virtual summit presentation, Bridging the Gap Co Requisite Mathematics at Navarro College. My name is Hannah Bullard, and I'm the Educational Courseware Specialist here at Hawks Learning. Um, our speakers today are Professor Amy Young and Brandon Ford of Navarro College. Professor Young has taught developmental mathematics at Navarro College for over 15 years. During this time, she has been working on her PhD in education. At Navarro College, Amy has taught both credit level math and psychology courses. She has also assisted in creating a handbook for the adjunct faculty and has been instrumental in developing and organizing a conference for the adjunct instructors teaching developmental math, reading, and writing. Professor Ford has taught developmental mathematics with the Hawks Learning course Courseware since 2007. He's a full-time professor and department chair of developmental studies at Navarro College. We are excited to have you here with us today. If you have any questions during this webinar, please enter those into the question and answer box located on the panel at the top or the bottom of the screen, and we will address them at the end of the talk. On this note, I will go ahead and hand it over to the presenters. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope that uh, everybody is staying well during this uh, unprecedented situation that we're uh, seeing right now. Uh, you can see that, um, our presentation is going to be Bridging the Gap, Correquisite Mathematics in the Durham College. Um, both uh, Professor Young and I are in the same room, so we are really, really bridging the gap. Um, <laughs> we are not holding on to that six-foot rule. We wanted to make sure that we didn't have a lot of reverb having multiple computers going. So um, I think we're both relatively healthy, though, so there shouldn't be a whole lot of stress there. Um, so what we thought we would do uh, in this presentation is just talk about some of the various um, activities that we do in classes and things like that and and how we really try to get student engagement up with prerequisites. They're, they're, they're strange courses, uh, they're, they're new, uh, and we just wanted to kind of uh, give y'all a, a few things that we do and, and maybe that will help you with student engagement and retention. So before we get into actually what we do in the classroom, let's talk about our setup because uh, sometimes that, that can help. Um, we are set as a 3-3 three, three, uh, type of, uh, of course structure here at Navarro. Uh, we offer a three-hour credit course, immediately, uh, actually a three-hour support course, uh, which is then immediately followed by a three-hour credit course. We always try to do that three-hour support course before the credit. That way, uh, we can try to prep the students just in time remediation uh, before they actually go into that college algebra. We also try to not make it completely back-to-back -back unless we're like one hour setups. Three hours sitting in a classroom learning math gets pretty um, uh, daunting for, for many students. Yeah, so um, when he talks about not back-to-back, -back, we do have some instances where the classes are on the same day. So maybe the developmental class or the support course is at 8 a.m. and then the college credit class is at 11 a.m. Um, or even maybe even later. So if they do happen on the de same day, we'd like to ha at least have an hour and a half break between the two. Um, other than that, we try to do them on opposite days. So if they meet Monday, Wednesday with the developmental at 8 a.m., then they meet Tuesday, Thursday with the credit level at 8 a.m., um, kind of doing that consistency for the students. So they kind of always know that they have math at 8 a.m. every morning. Absolutely. And then um, we do have a commingled structure for our face-to-face -face classes. Uh, it's 20 developmental students to 10 credit students. Um, the 20 developmental students are obviously in the support course as well as the credit level and mingled in with 10 um, college-ready students. If, if we have 10, some of our classes maybe only have two or three, but that's just um, kind of the way this the courses fall. Absolutely. Now we are doing some online co-requisites. Um, we just have no choice but to do that in order to meet our 75 uh, requirement that Texas uh, has put in place through House Bill 2223. Um, but we, on our online, we're not doing commingled, we're actually doing cohorted. We found that that is uh, working better to try to keep the students more on track. Um, we're doing co-teaching. Um, that is that is a college decision um, in which we have a different instructor for the uh, credit versus the uh, developmental side um, and we do 
various types of course offerings. Um, some we do four days a week, the developmental on Tuesday, Thursday, the credit on Monday, Wednesday, or vice versa. Um, or we have that break in between if we do the credit and development on the same day. One of the biggest things that we do, and it was, uh, we had to learn this the hard way the first time, is that if a student is dropped from one course, then they're dropped from both. Uh, these truly are co-courses. Uh, co so if a student stops doing developmental, they're dropped from credit. If, if they don't do credit, they're dropped from developmental. Um, we have found that that helps um, the students um, not put all of their eggs in one basket, uh, basically, is, is what we're trying to avoid there. Okay, so um, the course material that we are currently using is we do the Hawks Integrated Review for our college algebra. We started that in the fall of 2019. Prior to that, we actually dropped using a textbook in the co-requisites, mainly because we didn't want the students having to buy two different textbooks at the same time, um, when both of them are quite expensive as well. Any product is expensive, $70 for their college algebra, $70 for their developmental, and that was just a lot of money for us to have our students buying. Um, so when the integrated review software came out, we were like, yay, this is awesome and fabulous, and we love it because Hawks has already done that work of connecting some of the concepts um, from the college algebra to what they would have done in the developmental portion, um, and then it, it didn't cost our students an arm and a leg to purchase. Um, so we did do that in the fall of 2019, switch over to that, and we absolutely loved it for our college algebra. We are using it right now for our statistics online, and we will be using the statistics integrated review, the viewing life mathematically for our contemporary with the integrated review, and the business math for Texas integrated review for the fall of this year. Um, we'll go to all of those um, using the Hawks product. So we were really excited to see that happen. Um, and it really does make the prep on our side of the support course a lot easier when you have um, that integrated review software to kind of build your curriculum mm -hmm. off of. Absolutely. And it was when we chose not to use a textbook, it was a disaster for our adjuncts. Um, they were used to us giving them everything. Um, basically a pre-made course and then saying, great, go do what you do best, go teach. Um, but when it came to the Corex, it's not that simple if you're not uh, running, running without a software. So now we're actually able to, with this integrated review software, basically hand them a prefab course again and say, okay, go do, do what you do best, go teach. And to some extent, a free pad, a little bit of, um, and we, and this is again still part of the difficulty of a prerequisite class, especially if you have a lot of adjuncts teaching the, the support course side of it. Um, for, for instance, I am paired as a support course with two different instructors, and my two different instructors teach concepts differently from each other. So when I'm walking into a classroom, I may have the exact same material to go over, but I also have to not only think about the material that I'm going over, I have to also think about how does um, Julie teach this versus how does Brandon teach this and so it's really important um, and I know you've probably heard this so many times but it is so important to get your faculty to communicate with each other and really talk about what is expected from the students um, and what kind of skills they want to learn and how the college algebra instructor actually teaches a concept so that when you're teaching a pre-concept you're guiding them to that that final answer that the college instructor is going to be wanting from them. Um, but in addition to just the Hawk software, we do a lot of hands-on stuff inside the classroom as well. But I think that helps our students, especially in the statistics and the contemporary math class, really helps them grab the concepts that we're talking about. We still do a little bit in the college algebra, not quite as much as the other two courses. I actually call the contemporary and stats the fun courses, um, especially for me because I've mainly teach college algebra or algebra based courses. So this is kind of a deviation for what I've learned how to do. So you get to play a little bit. <clears throat> yes. Okay, so um, more than anything, uh, it's gonna be a cultural shift in the classroom. Um, yes, they're gonna be able to, to have some homework assignments uh, through the Hawks Learning System if that's what you choose. If not, whatever your software is. Uh, but in the classroom, we are really, taking what they would learn in a credit-based course, um, and we are drilling down, actually letting them practice with it. There's a lot of collaborative work. Um, there's a lot of early referral to support 
if they need it. Um, we are their mentors, if you will, uh, in this uh, developmental sequence. So we are the ones that are really holding their hand and getting them through this stuff. It's, I was just going to say, it's really kind of funny because a lot of times what you'll see happen is that actually I, I, I teach with Brandon quite often. And I had a student a couple semesters ago that came up to me as the support course instructor saying that she needed to talk to um, Mr. Ford about a certain test or, or assignment or a test or something and I said well let's go let's go talk to him and she's like no he's scary I'm like he's not <laughs> scary and so sometimes it's just um, as a developmental or a support course they, they connect to you a little bit better um, not because you're a better instructor not because you care more or, or anything like that but because you're a little bit more free in your classroom structure than the typically the college credit class um, so it's kind of funny to see that because I know Brandon, I've known him for years and he's not scary at all. So it's just kind of funny that the students yeah. you know, see that difference between the two instructors. Absolutely. Um, and so what the, the little topics we're going to talk about today are this idea of how are we going to maintain the attention of your students. Um, if, if a student is in six hours of mathematics a week, um, they are going to get tired. Uh, they just really are. And so if, if you're running your developmental course, uh, that's just more of the same, more lecture, more homework, um, you could lose your students. So these are a few things that we've put together. It is certainly not an all-inclusive list, um, but we, we hope that um, they will either get, get some thoughts going or, or even uh, if uh, they'll help you in your class. And um, I will say this before we continue on, um, I do have a PDF. I just made a PDF of every single worksheet that we were going to give you had we had the conference. Um, I'm going to send that out to Daniel and make sure that that gets to you guys um, um, as well as the PowerPoint if you need that as well. Uh, so anything that we show you as far as documents, uh, they will be available to you. you wanna... I'm going to let you take this. Okay. Um, I can so, step away from the um, for just a second. I was the first person to pilot the, the college algebra in here at the Corsican campus. And I will admit when I first started this, I was very skeptical. And I think part of it is that we try to mesh what we do in the introductory and intermediate algebra into the prerequisite class. And we need to stop thinking that way. We need to go problem by problem through the college algebra textbook and decide what prior skills are needed for those students. Um, some things that we would like to see happen, especially for Texas, is a little bit more flexible student learning outcomes, maybe ones that match better to the course you're co-wrecking with. Um, and then, like I've told you before, communication between the instructors, um, preferably on a daily basis, but at least on a weekly basis, is so vital for, for the success of these classes. And um, as you get teaching with a certain instructor, that maybe that communication isn't quite as daily needed um, just because you've gotten used to this, their style of instruction um, but you definitely need to talk about your students and, and how they're doing and maybe what they're struggling at or not struggling at um, and then we need to be flexible I mean I hope everybody is learning that right now with what's going on across the state um, we're going to be in online classes till at least April 13th if not longer and so yes we're having to be very flexible with how we're covering the material and um, the due dates of it you need to be able to move and, and guide with your college algebra instructor and then communicating that the development of course is a mandatory support class and that it is important for these students to success and that's not just to the students that's to your administration and your counselors and everybody on campus to understand that there is a reason why we have this course and that it is for our student success um, and that they do need to attend and participate in the class and then Brandon's favorite saying yeah I believe that everyone should live by this and that is the long forgotten beatitude of blessed are the flexible but they'll not be bent out of shape uh, it's very 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 important uh, that you stay flexible in these courses uh, because there's always going to be something different there there's always going to be something to have to deal with and so um, just hope to keep that in the back of your mind Especially right now. Especially right now <laughs> during this uh, this crazy time that we're in. Um, so what, what we wanted to do was just provide you with a couple of examples of some things that we do um, in each of the classes um, for 
the different co-recs that we do. Uh, college algebra and business math have a lot of the same topics and a lot of the same activities that cross over there. So we didn't really focus too much on the business math side because they are very, very similar. So usually what you can use in college algebra, you can also use in the business math. Um, my favorite one in college algebra, I have a transformation activity and I did not even know Desmos allowed you to create activities until last semester. And once I found that out, I was like, this is awesome. Um, and not only will they let you create your own activities, they have a huge repository yes. of activities that you already got that you could assign your students. And they are free for you and they are free for your students, which is even more awesome. Um, so one of the things that I've done over the last year and a half is to create guided notes for my students. So I actually provide them with um, PDF worksheets every day in class that we use uh, along with my iPad and we have an Apple TV so I actually can write on my iPad and display it on our projector at the same time. By the way, if you have any means to getting some technology, that is one of the most awesome technology pieces you can do. And it's not even that expensive. What, $1,000 for everything? We spend, yeah, we spent about $900 and that included the iPad, the Apple TV, and the Apple Pencil. So Yeah. Um, and it's, it is a game changer in the classroom. It's really cool. If you want extra information about that, you can definitely contact Brandon or myself. Uh, our emails are at the end of the presentation. Um, but I wanted to show you what my guided notes look like. So I'm going to go ahead and exit out of this real quick. And again, everything that I'm showing you here will be also provided. Where is it? Um, I lost the documents. <laughs> well, never mind. Let me see real quick. Sorry about this, guys. Oh, there we go. All right, hold on while that comes up. Um, so this, again, everything that's in this document, in this PDF, you will have access to um, as it's coming up. But again, it's just a guided notes. Um, I want you to understand that at this point, we've already graphed through the common functions. And when I talk about graphing through the common functions, I literally make the students pick points plug them into the function, graph the points, and graph the function. I think sometimes for our developmental students, the actual act of plugging in those values and creating those um, graphs helps them remember it. Just close it. All right, so we've already talked about the common functions, and then what we go through is I talk to them about how do you identify the common function once you know that it is, if you have a graph, and then, um, I always try to have the your turns in my guided notes. So we'll do the first four together and then I let them try it on their own in class and compare their answer to their neighbor. Um, that has been one of the biggest uh, things that students have told me is um, they say, look, I learn best by doing it. And so I'm like, great, well, let's do it then. I mean, you, I'll show you some examples and then you get out there and you work it and let's, uh, let's see where you're, you're messing up because it may be something very small. Uh, and that not only helps them learn what their mistakes are, but it also increases their self-efficacy when it comes down to, oh, you mean I'm only dropping a sign? Yeah, other than that, you know what you're doing, right? So all of these are things that we've got to learn or we've got to teach these students in, in these classes. And so then, because I am talking about the transformation rules, and I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to step on my college algebra instructor's toes, but this just really kind of, hones in what these numbers do to these graphs. So I actually pull up Desmos, the graphing calculator on um, my iPad, and we go through graphing each one of these and talking about what does the plus three do? What does the minus three do? What is multiplying by five or, or multiplying by one fifth? What does that actually physically do to our graph as we go through and we talk about all of these rules and then we follow it up at, at the end with um, just a, a guide to transformation where we talk about what everything actually means and I actually think they get this one twice because we do it in the developmental and then um, the college algebra instructor turns around and does it in their class the exact same for format and I know that seems silly but again sometimes with some of this concepts it's it's exposure and and having it exposed exposed to you more than once on a basic level um, really helps when they start combining all of those transformations together into one big problem. I agree completely. Uh, so the, so there's this other activity that's been created um, that's called the Desmos. Oh, sorry. 
Um, so we can go into Desmos. Um, and now this is the Desmos teacher. This is the student side actually. And so if you'll go back to my presentation, I actually gave you guys a student code. It's right here, KRD. Q -I -T. Um, so you would just go to student.desmos.com and you would enter that code in. And um, this, I just wanted you guys to get a chance to play around with it as well. It's, it's, sorry, it's TT, not IT. Um, and you can actually continue without signing in. So the students don't have to sign in. You don't have to sign in. They do have, you have to put a name. And I usually tell my students to put their full name so that um, this is for a grade. So I want them to be able to. Don't type in an emoji. Yes, don't type yeah. in emojis, which they will do if you don't <laughs> tell them. Um, and this just ex explains what they're supposed to do. They're gonna match each of the graphs to the function. Um, note your match re um, red graph. Oh, there's a red graph and then a black dotted graph is the parent function just to kind of let them understand. And if I go to the next step here on the side, you can see all of the little tiles that are there. And so we have a graph here where we have the graph of the parent function as well as the movement. And then we have little tiles that talk about the um, actual movements that they had listed. And then we also have um, the what function, the, the actual function, function is. is. Mm -hmm. And so they're supposed to let, match a graph with its function totation with its movements. Um, and they can just match them together. And it's super simple to do. So I'm gonna take this um, absolute value of x plus three, and all I have to do is grab my, that looks like three, that looks pretty close. So I can bring my absolute value of x plus three, and these actually connect. So it tells me that I've got these two cards together. Um, and then I can find uh, right here, in, I can find in my um, uh, third card what it actually is doing. So we can put that into place there as well. So now this is a completed set of three cards. It can just kind of be pulled over to the side and then the students can work on anything. But they can feels, actually minimize it as well. Yeah, and it just makes the students kind of feel like it's, it's a little more of a puzzle, right? It, it, anything we can do to, to uh, turn on a piece of their brain that, that, that currently is, is, is shut off uh, is something that we want to try to do. And they can work this. It's a little more fun uh, and a little more active. Now, once they have finished all this. All they have to do is close it. There's no submit button to it. Okay, it, close it. Yeah, you can close it. So we can close that. Now we can go into the teacher. That's what I'm not uh, and this is what you would, would go into. So when we sign in as the instructor. <clears throat> And again, all of this is free. Um, what I would do is I actually made this particular um, thing, but so it would be under custom, or you can actually even go under collections. Collections, you can create like class collections if you wanted to do that. Sometimes it makes it a little easier and you can see all of the things that you've put in here. Um, I believe mine is called transformation matching. Mm -hmm. And then here are the class codes that I have. This is the one that I gave you guys. So if I view the dashboard, you'll be able to see the work that Brandon just did. Um, so I'll notice they're not logged in and they must not be engaging them. <laughs> so there's the, there's the login. And then you can look, if I click this button right here, right here, it'll actually pull up my, the dashboard of that particular student shows me that they got these three correct, connected correctly. If it's red, it will show you that it's, um, that it's incorrect. That incorrect. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a nice little way to see very quickly. Now you have to tell it what tiles match together when you create the, um, activity. the activity, but it's, again, it's really super easy to create. It's one, of, I, like I said, it's a really cool, neat way. And then again, there's just this huge amount of activities that you can um, assign to your students, or you can, some of them you can download and change them how you feel that you need to change them. And all you have to do is start searching. Um, on the side note, I showed this to our English instructor and he was really excited because he wanted to be able to put matching definitions to words um, on the tiles. And since mm -hmm. you can write anything or you want. Or authors with books. Or authors or with books. All kinds or, of things. Yeah, because you can write anything you want on those tiles and match them up together. So it's a really cool little feature. Um, and there's, there are um, videos on how to do all of this built into Desmos. Um, so the, for the student, it's student.desmos.com and for the teacher, it's teacher.desmos.com. So two really, really, one really cool website that allows you to do quite a few different things. Absolutely. Um, so the next one, um, we, 
this is one of those things that we were going to do with you in person um, if we could see your lovely smiling faces. Um, now, there's a couple of ways you can do this. We use what's called a dry erase block. Um, it's hard to tell, but all of these white services, they're uh, dry erase boards. Um, you could also do something if you're a big fan of the old uh, comedy series, um, Whose Line Is It Anyway? You could do functions from a hat or something like that, where basically the student is going to somehow randomize functions. Yeah, and you would do need two blocks so that they could get an f of x function and then a g of x function, because you are going to having them add and subtract and multiply or even do function composition. So it's a really cool way. By the way, these were on Amazon. I know Amazon's really busy right now, so it might be hard to get these, but they were on Amazon, and I think a box of these was $5. So not a very expensive one, I think. A, I have a whole bunch of them in my office. I bought a whole bunch. Um, I will also say they come with a marker. Don't use it. Go get a um, a wet what, a wet erase a, a, wet, a, vis -a, -vis. Yeah, a vis a vis marker. They stay on a lot better than the markers that they provided in the box. Um, most of us have those in our offices. So just kind of as a side note, and they do come in four different colors, so you can color code your f of x and your g of x. The other thing you'll need is a standard six sided die. So I've got a. Um, a little foam one here. Uh, I like the big ones because what it does is it lets a student be able to see it pretty easily. And then you need a, a worksheet with the various functions on it. So, and we have a worksheet in um, in that mm -hmm. in the PDF file. There is a worksheet that we have created, a half sheet where they write down um, where it defines what, like if you roll a one on your dice, you're adding the functions. If you roll a two, you're subtracting them. So it defines what you're doing with each of the numbers on your dice. Um, and then they write down the functions that they got either from the dry erase markers or um, dice or from the functions from a hat. Right. Um, and you can have the students do this. I think there's there's a spot for them to do it three or six if you want to give them the whole, it's a half sheet. So you can give them, they could do it six times, they could just do it three times. It's up to you guys how you want to work that. You could also have them not only find the combination function, but then tell you what the domain and domain of that function is. Because that's a, one of the places where our kids tend to struggle quite often. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this just gets the students up and moving. Um, I was having a really hard time engaging my statistics class. And we're going to talk about the game of greed here in a little bit. But I was having a really hard time engaging them. And um, one day we played the game of greed, and that changed everything. Um, I had a student that said, hey, well, can I roll, can I roll the dice? I'm like, absolutely, you can roll the dice. Um, and once that student got up, we put some music on the background, that student started rolling dice, complete game changer. Everybody was just engaged. So something as simple as saying, hey, here's you a bunch of blocks, roll it, determine what your functions are, uh, complete game changer. Yeah. Taking something that would have been just a worksheet where you've added asked them to add or subtract these two functions and making it a game seems like such a silly idea that would actually work out really well and they really enjoy um, doing this particular activity uh, for our college algebra class. Um, the next one is the, the game, game of greed. greed. So um, <laughs> You mind if I take this one? Yeah, you, you love it so much. This one's fun. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we're gonna jump back and forth between a website um, uh, and, and here. But the game of greed, it is basically just a fun way of creating a data set. So um, you'll take your, your set of dice um, and you can let a student, uh, you can let a student roll it or you can roll it however you choose to do it. But what happens is the student rolls the first two dice, and that begins your, your that, that is the start of your game. So if I were to roll, and I roll a nine. Um, a very good roll, Brandon. Well, not a good roll, but still. <laughs> um, they don't allow that kind of roll in Vegas. But um, So say I roll a nine. Well, that's where we begin. Now, the students have choices now. The student can take nine and sit down, or... They can gamble, I wouldn't supposed to say that, they can uh, take their chances on the next roll. Now, if the next roll rolls a two or a four, the student sits down and loses all everything. Students, yeah, all students lose all points if they, were, if if they are still, still standing. standing. If a student does not, uh, then they get to add whatever that number. So let's say I rolled a five. Then the student can add that to the nine we had before. Now they've got 14. And Does that make sense? And again, they have the choice at this time. They can sit down, because every student is standing at the beginning mm -hmm. of the game. When you roll the first two dice, they get to decide, do they want the nine points, and they get to sit down, or do they want to 
um, go for more. And if they you go and you got roll the five, now they have 14 points. So they get to decide at this point, do they want to sit down with the 14 points or do they want to, again, keep chancing it and seeing what they get? Um, so for example, so the way that this would work, um, I'm just pulling up a random dice generator. So we can roll and um, that would be, and you can feel free to play with us if you want to. You can stand up at your, uh, your computer. No one can see you, so no one will judge you, I promise. But so, so say uh, here we are, we've rolled uh, eight on our first dice. So everybody at this <clears> point <throat> is starting with eight points for round one. We do this in rounds, by the way. So uh, we usually do six rounds to get a fairly a decent nice data set. group of, of numbers. Um, so everybody at this point is starting out with six points. And you would need to decide before we roll the next one whether or not you wanted to keep your six points or go for more. So if you want to keep your six points, you sit down, you write six on your round one document. We do actually, again, have a, a, a worksheet for the mm -hmm. students to do on this one as well. Now, if you're still standing, I'm going to roll the dice and we're going to see what happens. So we remember it was six, or no, eight. It was eight. So now we're going to roll again. So now we roll another six. So now, so now we're to 14. 14. And uh, so if you choose to take, keep 14 and not play again, you can sit down and write 14 on your paper. If you don't want to, you want to keep gambling, I'm sorry, chancing it, then uh, you can stay standing and we roll again. Uh-oh. Oh. So now anybody who's standing has zero points on round one, they write zero and that ends the first round. You go back to rolling two dice again mm -hmm. to start the second round. Now, then, I always try to give some sort of an incentive for the high score of each round because the students, well, they don't know what's coming the first time around, but if you play multiple times, they will. What you're doing is you're developing a data set. So you can do mean, median, mode, range, standard deviation, variance, you can do all kinds of things with this random data set numbers. Just a fun way of getting them. Um, and it breaks up, um, breaks up your class. Now, what students could do if you don't offer an incentive is to say, ooh, if I get zero, that's an easy thing to take the average of, right? The average of zero is really easy to find. Those students, um, one, they don't get the chance of, of getting whatever prize I've got for the day. But I also say, oh, well, congratulations. Here's you a data set that I have created for you. And usually doing that a couple of times um, gets them actually more engaged uh, in the future. So I, I, I hope that helps. Um, that's one of our favorites. Yeah, that, and that's one of our students' favorites. And I use that both in statistics <laughs> as well as in contemporary math. Um, and it's a lot of fun nice way um, and by the way I randomly picked the number two and four to be the um, zero point the zero point ones you could choose any numbers you wanted you could add more you could say if they if it was a two four or six they got no points um, it's up to you on what you do I think when I first found this game it was only one number that created no points and now um, and I thought I said, no I really want it to be more than one so I did the two or the four uh, Okay. Oh. Go ahead. So this is just, again, another um, thing for statistics and or contemporary math. Um, when we start talking about theoretical versus um, experimental probability, I've created a couple of probability stations with using dice and coins and spinners where they have to, um, you know, spin a dice and roll or spin a, a spin a spinner, a colored spinner, and roll a dice, and they have to record the, the um, outcomes, and they do that 50 times, and then they go figure out the probability of their 50 experiments, and then they, on the back side of it, they then figure out the theoretical probability, kind of talking about that, and then a lot of times what I'll have them do is they go, they work through the stations, and then I'll have them switch it up where they go with other people, and they combine their 50 rolls, and they see and it's kind of trying to get this idea that the more times I experiment with something, the closer and closer it gets to the theoretical. And this right. is one option to do it. Keeps the kids moving in the class. You get about, um, in an hour and 15 minute class, I usually do about 15 minutes at a station. That's usually plenty of time. Working in pairs, so you have one person spinning and one person rolling the dice or flipping a coin or however you want to do that. I actually stole this from a kit that, uh, a teacher gave to us and there's just a whole bunch of these cards in here and I'm going to kind of get a little bit closer so you can see it a little bit where it talks about spinning you know spinning a spinner and doing all kinds of things and making a chart of what actually happened 
is kind of a cool little activity. Again, um, I've given you two of them. They're in the packet, so you can kind of look over them uh, and ask the question and have the students ask the questions. A lot of times after the, the you might not see the question on the thing, but afterwards I'll talk to them or make them answer to turn in what happens the more times you do an experiment, you know, trying to get that concept across to them. And it makes it easier as you're sitting there. Um, I always have the class bring up all of their DOS roles and things like that and I enter it into an Excel sheet um, and That's they can the start one. seeing, oh it's for the next one. Yeah, this oh, is the other one. This yeah. is another one, kind of the same concept, um, but not not really moving around the classroom, but it's a dice lab. So they roll a pair of dice over and over again and record their rolls. And usually I have them roll it until one of them gets to 20. Um, the, the worksheet that's in the packet has them go up to it could go up. I think up 40 or 50. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's, that, that's a little much. Usually, if they roll to get one of the numbers to 20, they'll roll a good um, 100 times. So, usually in pairs, rolling the dice and, and recording it. And then again, they do the theoretical or the experimental followed directly by the theoretical. And then what Brandon is talking about is, yeah, up on the Excel sheet, I have the students bring me. Um, I rolled eight, or I rolled seven, 15 times. I rolled six, 14, and you know, uh, eight, 13, and and I start entering that into an Excel sheet, and I've and I've got programmed into it this uh, graph that every time I enter the graph change, it's just a simple bar graph, and so when the first set of students bring it out, it's going to be somewhat normal. It's not, not going to be exactly, but with every group that comes up and gives me their numbers, I, I stop the class and say, okay, everybody look up. I'm putting in a new uh, data set. And when I put it in that, that graph gets more and more and more and more and more normal. It's a way to generate a very large data set uh, in a very small amount of time and let the students see how the larger your um, the larger your data set, the more normal the data becomes. The more it, it, the more it converges onto the theoretical. So it's, again, it's just a kind of a cool way to get them thinking about that theoretical probability versus that experimental probability. It's a really nice, um, well, I think really, we actually, I actually found this online. So I thought they did a really good job um, in creating that, that activity. I will say that when I print it out, <laughs> the, the way that they had it laid out in the activity online, the the re record sheet that they do for their roles was at the back and it will really confuse them. So what I typically do is hand them the record sheet first and tell them what to do. And when they get to their 20, then I go give them the actual um, document that talks about the, the probabilities of what happened in their experiment because that just makes a lot more sense to them if they have the the record sheet first and then they get the the uh, rest of the document later um, this is another really cool one i actually stole this from one of our college algebra instructors she does this for her college algebra class it's just a flip chart i'm using um, a basic folder um, i got this from a, uh, another instructor here at work she had a whole bunch of them and so we used them in her class and all we've done for the stat class is every time they got a new formula we would write the formula on the front. We would write what every symbol or what every symbol meant. So what did X bar mean? What did sigma mean? What did the mu mean? What everything meant. And then on the back side, if possible, because you know there are some problems that you can't do on the back of a, a note card, we would write an example. So that when they were doing their homework, they could flip through um, the, the different problems and work through those problems. We also wrote the section of the topic. So um, you can kind of see on the other picture over here to the side where you have set, uh, sample variance and it says section 3.2a because that was the section it was out of. So we kind of did that and I did that along with them with a document camera up at the front of the screen. It really, they really seemed to like it and they would be like, oh, we had some new formulas. Are we gonna do our chart today? Um, and they were really good about this one. I, I really enjoyed doing this with them. Um, and again, you're just, you're reinforcing a concept without having to feel like you're drilling it into their head right? because they're creating something that they can use in the future. And like I said, um, uh, I got this from our college algebra instructor who does the same thing for college algebra. Every time they come up with a new topic or a new concept, she has them do an example on a, 
on a note card for them um, so they can flip through that as they're going through their homework or um, studying for their test. So it's a kind of cool concept. This one's fun. Um, I do this one um, quite a bit. Um, you'll note that uh, we have given you a blank one um, as well as given you a metric conversion and a solving equations. These are mazes. So um, basically what it is, it's, it's hard to see here, but uh, there's a question right here uh, that says start. And then there's an answer along each of the diagonals. <clears throat> now the answer to this question will lead them to one of these boxes and then so on and so forth. So basically, uh, and you can make it to where they do as many of these problems as you like until they get to the end. Um, and basically what this does is it makes the students, I mean, I could give them a worksheet and I could say, hey, work these five problems. Um, and they moan and groan and they, they don't wanna do it. But whenever I create this game, um, and, and it's no different. I mean, they're still working the problems, but something about making it a game where they're trying to get to the finish, I have great, great uh, mm -hmm. results with. Um, um, I will say, whenever you're working on your blank one, create your template first <laughs> on how to get to the end and then go back and fill it in. Yeah. Um, because yeah, whenever you start working through this, if you don't do that, um, you'll- It's you'll, confusing very fast. Correct. Um, <laughs> And so then, we've given you a matrix uh, conversion and we've given you a solving equations. And then we've also given you this blank one that you can go in and you can do whatever you want. Um, uh, exponential functions, rules of exponents, whatever it is that you think works um, for your particular class. We find that this one works very, very, very so well. So basically anything that you would give them as a, a worksheet, you could give them as a mace. Um, and once you create it, it's created forever. It's again a nice little thing um, to do. And um, I actually got this idea off of Teachers Pay Teachers that I went and created my own. So, um, just in a Word document. Okay. This is another one of my favorite ones. And I think Brandon gets mad at me for this one because it again is a lot of fun with the students and I get to give them candy. <laughs> and that's always a good thing. But what we have, um, and we actually got these uh, from a instructor here on our campus that teaches uh, the education for teachers mm -hmm. um, and they are just circle Venn diagrams you could also use like a hula hoop from the Dollar Tree to do the same oh, thing yeah, absolutely. Um, but these are really cool because they're in different colors we can give the students a, a yellow red and a blue one so that they can do a Venn diagram with three and everybody can have the same diagram um, and we really again this was one of the activities we really wanted to do with you guys and I'm so mm -hmm. sorry that we can't um, but I did take some pictures to kind of help you understand. And I use the candy because kids love candy. I don't care how old they are. No one likes Milky Ways, apparently. Yeah, no, they, <laughs> they clear out my Snickers and Twix, but I've got an office full of Milky Ways. So if you don't want to do <clears throat> actual candy, you what I did, um, and this is what we were going to do, is I actually just wrote down on one side of a note card a candy bar. So I had a Heath bar. And then on the back side, I went ahead and wrote the ingredients. And I don't mean like specific ingredients, but just what's in a Heath bar. So chocolate and toffee. I did this because I noticed when I used actual candy, there was candy that people didn't know what was in it. So like they didn't know what was in a Milky Way. In fact, they were like, can we eat the Milky Way so we can figure out what's in it? And I'm like, so I would hand them an extra Milky Way or something. So it's just a way that you can kind of tell them what's actually in I think you in. got conned is what I think happened there. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> but I will say this. Well, the one who ate it was like, no, I'm not eating more. She took a little bite and said, no, I don't like this. So it was pretty funny. Um, so that's just one way to do that. And obviously, you can use anything you want on these note cards um, mm -hmm. that you want to put into a Venn diagram. And this is so helpful, especially I, I found for my contemporary math students, because to them, a Venn diagram seems to be very abstract and, mm -hmm. um, and hard to kind of picture. So this one allows you to start talking about these Venn diagrams without actually talking about this is, this is group A and this is group B and this is the union and this is in the intersection because you're actually talking about physical items that they can kind of play and mess with. And I would say that even if you use the note cards on the candy, I would go ahead and bring candy because, you know, again, kids love candy. So I went ahead and I'm not sure why that one got turned around in there, but I went ahead and I showed you what it would look like um, to separate these out and just um, 
I think that the red circle for this one is um, if they have some type of nut, peanut, almond, something of that nature. And the yellow circle is if they had any type of caramel in them. And so they can, and then you can talk. And the really cool thing about this is that you don't have to talk about things in terms of intersection and union. You just get to talk and you say, well, what, what candy has both nuts and caramel in it? And they're, they're, they're finding that intersection without actually having to say intersection. Or you can say, well, what candies didn't have either one of the caramel or the nuts in it? Or what candies only had um, caramel in it and they didn't have the nuts? So, so you're doing all of these, uh, these concepts of these complements and unions and intersections without actually having to say those words. And it really kind of, again, stresses and helps figure those things out. And then what I do to them, because I'm the mean math teacher, is I actually add a third circle. I usually call it chocolate. So that's the blue circle there, the chocolate circle. And then talk about how did adding that third um, circle affect my Venn diagram? What changed about my Venn diagram? Um, and you can make it as intricate or as simple as you want, right? Yeah. We could just say, what has chocolate versus not chocolate? What has, you know, the peanuts and the caramel, but not deal with all, but then you could also say universe, the complement. I mean, you can get as deep as you want to get. Um, notice that all of these uh, here on your screen, they're all chocolate bars, but uh, in the top one, um, it's a little more simple. At the bottom one, we've had it uh, in an entire another um, circle for a Venn diagram. So it can get as, as detailed as you want it to get. And I did have one candy, I think that was, didn't have chocolate in it. Or no, there's two. There's a, I have a, um, they, no, payday. And then there was a, the big hunk, I think is what it's called. But, um, so I did have some things that didn't have chocolate, but you could also add in here, um, like sweet tarts or, uh, Jolly Ranchers, which would be completely outside of the universe, even when you added that third circle in. The other thing that you could do is you could just give them the cards and give them two circles and say, hey, I want you to create a Venn diagram out of this. And they may come up with something completely different than nuts and caramel, mm -hmm. you know? So it's kind of a cool thing that you could have them really play and mess with this. You could do this with shapes if you wanted to do, um, squares and triangles and things like that and say I want um, shapes with four sides in this one and I want shapes with right angles in this one and you can really mess kind of mess with that idea of Venn diagrams and really giving them that hands-on activity to work with. So I really like the Venn diagram one. So uh, we probably won't have time to go through all of these. It looks like we've got about 15 minutes left and we want to make sure that we have time for your questions. But we've given you here a bunch of things that you can use in your classroom that's technology beyond it. Um, the kind of rule of thumb here is that you, you want to introduce things in your classroom that's gonna break everything up, but you don't wanna use the same thing every time. Um, mm -hmm. My students love Kahoot. They love Kahoot, man. It plays kind of upbeat music. They dance in the, they dance in the, the, the aisle while we're, while we're, when they finish answering their question. So they love Kahoot. But if I did it every day, it would get boring. Yeah. So these are a few um, ones that you, you can do. We've talked about student and teacher Desmos. Um, Kahoot uh, and Socrative and Quizzes and Quizlet, they're always different ways of testing the students. Like, for example, Kahoot is timed. Um, they have... And it's an entire classroom <clears throat> doing the activity Competing together. against each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really good for basic questions, really good for definitions and statistics and contemporary, really good for um, real simple, simple algebra concepts because right. typically, I mean, and you can make the time go up to three minutes, um, but you don't typically want to have questions up there that will take them that long to complete. You want to try to keep questions at about a minute a, a question because if you don't, if you do three minutes and the students who are really advanced are going to get really bored and the students who are not as advanced, it, it's just, it makes a, a crazy situation going on there. Um, but, um, but, and I want to tell you this too, I just received an email just so you guys know, Kahoot is actually giving everybody premium access for the rest of the year. I think um, Socrative is doing I think the, yeah, the Socrative, a lot of these web websites right now are free for you to use, but they have a premium add-on and a lot of the, the, these um, educational websites are actually giving people access to that premium, premium status for um, anywhere between just the next two months to the next year or the mm -hmm. full year. So that's a really nice thing. Um, 
Do we Flipgrid want... is a little different. Flipgrid um, is a way that you can get a student to, to basically take their selfie. They'll get their cell phone. They'll record themselves doing something. Um, and it's and you can use it for an introduction. You can use it for explaining a concept. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when I was in graduate school, we did a lot of Moore method or Texas method where the students did the proofs. You could do things like that where you assign a student, look, this is what uh, this is what we want you to explain. So that's a really good one as well if you want to kind of put the ball a little more in the student's court. And that one actually integrates really well with Canvas. If, you're fine, if your um, school is using the learning management system, you can actually integrate the Flipgrid and the Canvas together really nicely. Yes. Um, and then EduCreation, I, I, I'm, a lot of these I'm hoping that you guys are kind of familiar with. Um, EduCreation is a really cool one. And this again is one of the ones that we discovered through using our, our iPad. And I wanted to show you what that looks like um, on the instructor side. Again, it is free to a certain point. Um, I think you've got 50, 50, 50 meg, 50 meg of, of space, um, unless you go premium. Um, it is not real cheap. Oh, look. They're free for educators for the pro upgrade. So you can't upgrade it for free right now um, because of the virus. So that would be awesome because it, it's not cheap to not upgrade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, but it allows you to create lessons on a whiteboard. Um, and the really cool thing I think about this is it's super, super fast and easy. Um, typically I use education on my online classes. Um, I do some in my face-to-face -face classes as well, but it allows me to create a video. Like if they send me a question, like in the um, practice of Hawks where you can send to instructor, I can then take that question and immediately create a video within maybe 10 minutes of them sending the question and I can email them back and go, go to EduCreation, your video is posted. Mm -hmm. um, and it's free for the students, they just have to log in. And again, up to 50 megabytes um, normally is free for um, faculty, but as you can see, they're, they're letting us go to premium for, for free um, if you are a educator. So it's a really cool, really cool product. I really enjoy using EduCreation. My students really like it as well. Well, um, it looks like we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I hate not to be able to, uh, to uh, answer questions if y'all have them. Um, let's go ahead and jump real quick, uh, and we'll just use this as our kind of question screen. There's our contact information. You can reach out to us. Uh, probably best not to call us at our uh, office numbers, um, as we're not in the yeah. office. Um, with the, uh, the virus situation. But if you would shoot us an email, uh, we'll be happy to call you. Um, uh, and we will, um, we will follow up with the presentation, um, both a recording and the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you so much, Amy and Brandon. And I have a few um, that has come through my chat. Um, so the first question that, and you guys can continue to send them either through the chat or the Q&A if you do have any questions. The first one that I have here is, are the guided notes you create part of the overall grade for the course? I don't currently make them part of the grade for the course. I just use them in the classroom um, as a lecturing tool. Um, you could definitely make the students create a um, notebook of, of mm -hmm. notes and have that as a grade so that they have to. Um, and that would be really, with, with the iPad actually, it would work really well because if a student happened to miss class, they could still get the guided notes and they could still go on um, our Canvas because our Canvas is linked to their notes. So they could go on to Canvas and actually write the notes for the class that day. So I think that would be a great idea to ensure that students are actually taking the notes as they're going through the lecture. Again, it's blessed or the flexible, right? So um, I had a class that was just not very engaged. Um, attendance was spotty, attendance was poor. Uh, and so uh, about a couple weeks into the mes semester, I'm like, okay guys, we're adding, um, we're adding um, uh, a check for your homework uh, for, for these, these guided notes. Um, I want everyone to bring up their guided notes for the past week. Um, and if you've got them, you've got them 100. If you don't, then I'm so sorry, you, you, you lost those points. Um, and it was amazing how quick uh, attendance picked up. So um, while we don't always do them as homework assignments, it's definitely something you could implement uh, to support your course. And then the second question we hear is, have you received positive student feedback from Desmos? You mean from using Desmos? 
I, um, yes, yeah. I, absolutely. Yeah. So um, there are times that we will finish class lecture a little early and we'll run them down to the lab and we'll say, hey, we want you to work on this, uh, this assessment. And yes, they do like it um, because it's not the norm. They're, they're still studying, they're still practicing, they're still doing homework things, but it's not the normal pencil, paper, um, kind of dry homework problem. <clears throat> I will say that the one complaint we've had is they can't do it on their cell phone. Um, it doesn't oh, yeah, really yeah. work very well on cell phones. So yeah. they do have to use a computer. So um, at this point, for example, with the uh, corona outbreak um, or COVID-19, however we want to say it, but um, we have some students that don't have computers. That may be one that I shy away from a little bit as they start working from home. But <clears throat> whereas if I know my class well enough to know that they have the technology, I don't shy away from that in the classroom. But if I... Um, know that there's an issue, then I walk them down to a lab or I'll assign them something that they can do. And then I think this was asked um, a little bit before you went through that last page on the PowerPoint, um, but just I guess to reiterate for everyone who's in attendance, it says, are most of these technologies you showed um, free for students and instructors? What is Flipgrid? Which I think you may have answered, but if you just want to go through that a little bit more. So, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> everything that we showed them on there is free for both the student and the instructor within reason. Um, some of them do have a premium upgrade, um, but I, I don't pay for any of them. Um, on I, that note too, if you haven't, Screencast-O-Matic, if you need to make videos of your screen, is also a really good free option for that too. Um, that's one of the ones our, our online dean has sent to us before. Um, <clears throat> Flipgrid is basically a virtual or a video discussion board. So you can give the students a topic and ask them to create a 30 second or one minute video explaining whatever topic you've given to them. So basically it's taking that discussion board away from being a written thing and being a video. Um, and the students tend to really like it. Um, one of our instructors uses it uh, for his introductory discussion board. I'm sure he's probably gonna use it a little bit more now that we're, we're online. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just a different way to do a discussion board and it is free for the students. They can use their cell phone. It's just an app that they can download. <clears throat> Awesome. Um, all right. So I think that's all the questions we have for right now. Um, as you can see, Amy and Brandon's information is there and they're happy to answer any questions that you might have um, or are thinking about later on after this presentation. Uh, we want to thank both of the professors and thank you all for attending today. If you do have any questions um, for Hawks, you can please direct them to us at marketing at hawkslearning.com. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we will be emailing you a link to all sessions at the conclusion of our virtual summit. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you all.